Japan, a cultural dynamo. Post-war Japan has created some of the most iconic media worldwide. I'm sure you can think of something. Nintendo, right? And who's the mastermind when it comes to Nintendo? Shigeru Miyamoto. Well, there's more to it than that. But Super Mario Bros. and The Legend of Zelda were his ideas. But that was a long time ago now. Miyamoto is from a different era. When he was a kid, he had little besides his own imagination to occupy himself. Growing up in the town of Sanabe, there wasn't much to do except adventure. No hidden temples, of course, but enough to dream on. Most kids would have been traumatized by an encounter with a vicious guard dog, but for Miyamoto, this only served as inspiration. He once recollected, When I was a child, I went hiking and found a lake. It was quite a surprise for me to stumble upon it. When I travel around the country without a map, trying to find my way, stumbling on amazing things as I went, I realized how it felt to go on an adventure like this. Clearly, Miyamoto was destined for a career in archaeology, or cartography, or space travel. Well, no. Shigeru Miyamoto's college degree is in industrial design. Fitting in the sense that he loved to doodle, an oft-repeated anecdote has Miyamoto even wishing himself incapacitated so he'd have more time to draw. But he also played the banjo, played guitar in a band, and loved manga. So maybe design was the right track. Where do you go with a skill set like that? Nintendo. Only not Nintendo. A different Nintendo. One that came up with toy and board game ideas, as well as playing cards, which you've probably heard by now was its original purpose. But hey, who wants to play cards? How about some Nintendo Instant Rice? Maybe you ride one of these fine Nintendo taxi cabs. Believe it or not, those were some real ventures endorsed by Nintendo's president, Hiroshi Yamauchi. Shockingly, they were abject failures. But Yamauchi was no dummy. And he knew it was better just to go back to toys. But there were new kinds of toys to be had. He just needed someone to make them come to life. Thanks to his father's friendship with Yamauchi, Shigeru Miyamoto scored an interview with the man himself. Imagine showing up to an interview with the president of a great company like Nintendo without a resume in hand. Having to tell them that you spent your college days playing lousy Beatles covers? Yamauchi took one look at the 25-year-old Miyamoto and his array of strange creations. And he'd found his match. He put him to work alongside Gunpei Yokoi, who designed the Game & Watch games. Miyamoto worked primarily as an artist on the arcade game Sheriff and then as a developer on Radar Scope, which did well in Japan, but failed in North America. Rather than cut their losses, Yamauchi asked Miyamoto to convert the space shooting Radar Scope into something new. His solution? Donkey Kong! When Nintendo of America heard the premise of Donkey Kong, a carpenter rescuing his girlfriend from a cranky ape, they were dumbfounded and skeptical. And that was the genius of Miyamoto. He wasn't a developer in the sense of the nitty-gritty. He was an artist. At that time, when games made overseas used human characters, they were always rendered with lifelike proportions. I thought it was most likely that it was the programmer who was drawing these figures. But I thought, I know how to draw. He had come up with a story first, then a programmer built around it. This was the opposite of industry standard. Games didn't even have much story or personality back then. So Donkey Kong was mind-blowing. Donkey Kong was a smash hit thanks to Miyamoto. He wasn't just some nutcase who had a funny idea. He was involved in the whole process. Conferring with Yokoi and the programming team to figure out just what kind of innovation was possible with arcade games. The dynamics involved in the gameplay were unprecedented. The obstacles and ladders involved in the platforming, and especially the intelligible ways the characters moved on the screen. You might be thinking that the intertwined success of Yamauchi, a businessman from an older generation, and Miyamoto, the embodiment of Flight of Fancy, was a total fluke. But Yamauchi was familiar with the Disney Corporation from prior business deals, and he had wanted to meld his product line with that Disney magic. 
Who better to do this than someone who entered adolescence right at the time of some Disney classics? They came from different places, but arrived at the same wondrous goal. Yamauchi took the obvious next step of building a new team around Miyamoto. Yokoi convinced Miyamoto to develop around Jumpman, the player character from Donkey Kong, which resulted in the original Mario Bros. arcade game. Next came the big move. Nintendo wanted to move into the home console market. Now, you might take the Famicom, or Nintendo Entertainment System, for granted today. But at the time, developing a new console was a huge risk thanks to the video game crash of 1983. But Yamauchi knew he had the best team in the world, so on they marched, and by the end of the year, the Famicom was at the top of the market, headlined by Miyamoto's immortal Super Mario Bros. Miyamoto's philosophy beginning in this period was about creating something that he himself loved, rather than what he thought would sell. It might sound like an obvious virtue, but Miyamoto really believed it. And part of loving his work was putting some of his own experience into the games. I used to draw cartoons. I'd just show them to some of my friends, expecting that they were going to appreciate them, that they were going to enjoy reading them, and I haven't changed a bit about that. When I'm making video games today, I want people to be entertained. I am always thinking, how are people going to enjoy playing the games we are making today? And as long as I can enjoy something, other people can enjoy it too. That's how The Legend of Zelda was born. He drew on his youth, seeking to create an atmosphere of adventure and hidden secrets in nature. And gamers felt that love, leading to another landmark for Nintendo. As home consoles evolved, so did the games. Miyamoto and Nintendo iterated on their greatest titles with the Super Famicom leading to masterworks like Super Mario World and The Legend of Zelda A Link to the Past. They were able to work in more complicated ideas that had been held back by the limitations of the original Famicom, and the games were better than ever. However, Miyamoto was not principally focused on refining what he already had on the market. He was always looking to reach that higher plane. He developed many other projects that never saw the light of day, and his new ideas for existing franchises weren't always feasible such as a Mario game with a 3D perspective. Why was he so stingy with the sequels? Well, he once explained, I look back and play some of these games, and there are a lot of places where, to be honest, I'm a little embarrassed. I look at Super Mario 3 and was like, this was it? This is what we thought was good enough? While Miyamoto waited for the hardware to get better, Yamauchi pushed Yukoi for something new to tide the market over. Between console generations, Yukoi's unfinished Virtual Boy was released and failed miserably. Yukoi left the company soon after and would never return, passing away a short time later. With a new generation of developers at the helm, Nintendo was in unfamiliar territory with the Nintendo 64. Miyamoto knew he wanted to create his 3D Mario, but with 3D gaming a new frontier, they were going to have to pioneer how those types of games were going to handle. To do this, he spent countless hours with the rest of the team, as he had with Donkey Kong, and worked out the controls, and especially the player-controlled camera. Again, that's something you might not think much about. In the early days of 3D, there was an ocean of games with awful camera controls. Miyamoto and the Mario 64 team put the effort into this that's still paying off for developers. They brought in a programmer, Takumi Kamago, from the cancelled Star Fox 2, which was an early attempt at 3D innovation. Mario 64's camera was his only job. Meanwhile, Miyamoto made sure the movement of the character felt good too. Where the 2D Mario games controlled so nicely, he now had a more complicated task with three dimensions. The result was perfect. Super Mario 64 was a revolution, setting industry standards in every facet. Miyamoto gave the same treatment to The Legend of Zelda, resulting in Ocarina of Time, which had another notable first with its Z-targeting feature. The two games not only pushed the boundaries of what Mario and Zelda could be, but the whole of gaming. But as with the Super Famicom, Miyamoto found that the Nintendo 64 was limited in what it could do with his million dollar ideas. The Nintendo GameCube followed, and with it came Luigi's Mansion? For the first time, a Nintendo console launched without a Mario title, and fans felt its absence. You might remember that when the GameCube was new, there was a tech demo for a proposed Mario 128 a name which suggests an obvious follow-up to an instant classic. It showcased the raw power of new technology by having 128 Marios littering the screen, each with its own task, sometimes in dynamic ways. 
but while impressive in its own way, it didn't give Miyamoto very many creative ideas. The possibilities were numerous, but generic. His qualms were legitimate, but the fans wanted Mario, and he was forced to deliver. Super Mario Sunshine followed some time later, with Miyamoto instead incorporating Nintendo R&D's already existing experiments with a water pump into a new Mario. The game enjoyed considerable success, but failed to make a lasting impact the way Super Mario Bros., Super Mario World, and Super Mario 64 did. It was at this time that Yamauchi, the man who bet the farm on Shigeru Miyamoto's vision, decided it was time to step down as president. He named the company's star programmer, Satoru Iwata, the successor of the company. The soft-spoken Iwata was not comfortable with such a position of leadership, but Yamauchi had faith in his heart, values, and intuition. Iwata was a man who often single-handedly rescued games from development-related hurdles. Even once devising a new method of data compression on the fly to fit the entirety of content into a game. The reason for Iwata-san's selection comes down to his knowledge and understanding of Nintendo's hardware and software. An executive, regardless of his vast successes, is fundamentally an executive who doesn't intimately understand our products. I have come to the conclusion that it requires a special talent to manage a company in this industry. I believe him to be the best person for the job. Under Iwata, Nintendo released the Wii, which came to be the company's greatest success. And with it, came Super Mario Galaxy. It was a return to form for the Mario series, with sales eclipsing those of Super Mario 64 even. But when the Wii U came out six years later, it was a relative flop. In no small part due to its complete lack of a truly original Mario title. In addition, Miyamoto's tangent ideas were universally met with lukewarm reception. Tragedy struck Nintendo when Iwata was diagnosed with cancer in 2014, eventually succumbing to his illness the following year. This event threw the company into uncertainty, as Iwata had been Yamauchi's handpicked heir to the kingdom of Nintendo. Tatsumi Kimishima took the reins after only 13 short years under Iwata. So far, Kimishima has yet to prove himself effective in guiding the free-spirited Miyamoto the way Yamauchi and Iwata did before him. Running unchecked, Miyamoto's new titles and key franchises such as Paper Mario Sicker Star and Star Fox Zero each have had a little less luster with every generation. Once an unquestioned visionary and hero of gaming, fans have even come to wonder if Miyamoto has become a detriment. Miyamoto and Nintendo have always relied on innovation rather than polished graphics and processing power, but the company's attempts at innovation with the Wii U hardware and games have been derided as mere gimmicks rather than innovative, and Miyamoto's tendency to let his personal feelings guide him rather than what's popular with the fans make him appear increasingly out of touch with the players. They are also fighting an uphill battle against the diminishing returns that come with each new generation of consoles. There's only so much more companies can do with hardware these days, and thus, there are fewer frontiers left for Mario and Link to traverse. The newest Nintendo console, the Switch, and the games that Shigeru Miyamoto will seek to develop for it, have become a last bastion for those who remember the wonder that Nintendo used to achieve on a regular basis. Miyamoto is already a legend of gaming. But can he work his genius once more, or will the dream finally come to an end? <laughs>